uh, you mentioned, this is a talk, um, it's a two-person effort um, by Miriam Benesti and myself. Uh, but Miriam, um, because of her current internet connection, can't uh, help giving the talk, but she'll be in the chat and help with the questions. Uh, but I would, of course, encourage you to look at the online talk uh, where you can also get to see Miriam. All right, let's get started. You see it's going from submicron grains to pebbles to planetesimals, so we have a large range to cover. Um, and I'll be talking about these three points. I'll start with dust growth and dynamics and then how we think you might be forming planetesimals from that. And finally, because the first part is just theory, uh, we're going to have a bit of a reality check um, and see what observations are telling us. So let's dive right into it, dust growth and dynamics. All of this um, really uh, needs drag forces. All of this coupling between dust and gas is um, built upon uh, drag forces. Um, and there we, we have to distinguish between the particle sizes. This is really where um, differences in particle sizes come in. So we have small grains. Uh, theorists like to talk about the Stokes number that I um, put here, but if I say Stokes number, you can think of particle size, a small Stokes number, small particle size. And these small grains, um, they are very well coupled to the gas, just like cigarette smoke. That means their stopping time, the time on which they adapt to the gas speed, is much smaller than the orbital time scale. And if you imagine such a dust particle in a box of gas and you move it around, the particle will move along. But if we go to larger particles, we often call them pebbles. Um, so they are typically a Stokes number still smaller than one. That means that their stopping time starts to approach the orbital time scale. And that really means that they don't perfectly couple to the gas. Uh, they are somewhat partially decoupled. So if you move this gas around, the dust particle still feels it, uh, but not uh, that isn't following 100%. And if we go to very large ones, you might call them boulders. Uh, large size means large Stokes number. So they are basically not really coupling to the gas. Um, and if, the, if you move the gas, uh, this body doesn't really care. And uh, one of the important consequences of these drag forces is called radial drift. So if we imagine a body on a circular orbit around the star, then as you probably know, there's gravitational force pulling inward, centrifugal force uh, pulling outward. Um, and if we want it to be balanced, um, then you can equate uh, those two accelerations. And uh, the answer um, is the Keplerian velocity, right? But if we go now to, um, to, the, to a box of gas, uh, then uh, we have an additional force. Um, the gas also feels the pressure gradient. So there, um, the disk is usually hotter and denser in the center. That means high pressure inside, low pressure outside, and the pressure pushes outward. And if we add this force and we still want force balance and we can't change the gravity that's just given by the star, the only knob we can tune is the centrifugal force. So we have to reduce the centrifugal force. And if you put this in the, in the equation and solve it, you find that the orbital velocity of the gas is almost the same as the Keplerian velocity. So it's only about 0.1% slower than Kepler. And you might think it doesn't matter. But for a dust particle like this one, it matters because um, a small fraction of Keplerian speed is still something like tens of meters per second. So dust particle in a disk, um, it wants orbit Keplerian, but the gas is sub-Keplerian. So uh, basically, the gas is constantly trying to decelerate uh, the body uh, down to its sub-Keplerian speed. It takes away angular momentum of the body and the body drifts inwards. This works especially for the ones that we call pebbles. And if you look at the pressure gradient here, you see that for the normal pressure, uh, this is always inward. But we can, of course, uh, play around with the pressure gradient and change the direction. So this is dynamics. Uh, then we also need the particles to grow. We start with very small particles. Um, and as you see in this laboratory, um, experiments, small particles stick very well to each other. If we go a slightly larger, uh, then uh, we can have effects of erosion, or as you may be uh, seeing here, um, also mass deposition. And there's also less exciting um, effects where particles just hit each other and bounce off, almost like billiard balls. But as we go to larger particles, um, there's a, an effect where the particle velocity tends to increase with the particle size. And uh, those particles tend to fragment. Um, let me scroll forward a little bit. That works. And so the outcome is less, uh, less fortunate. Uh, so these bodies 
uh, just break up. So if I want to, uh, you to remember one thing uh, from this talk, uh, then it's uh, the following movie from YouTube. Um, this is basically what we imagine a product planetary disk to look like. Um, we have the midplane here, and there's dust particles that get stirred by the turbulent gas. Um, they might also even be ripped apart by it. The small particles get lifted very high into the atmosphere. And uh, the big particles, as you see here on the side, they uh, send a sediment to the midplane. And so looking at this, you immediately see what the gas is doing, despite the fact that you don't see the gas, the air here, right? Um, and that's a bit of a word of caution because um, you get a good glimpse on what it's doing, but it's not a one-to-one -one, um, relation. So the fact that this would be um, our dust radius and there's no dust be seen outside of it, doesn't mean that there's no gas. There's of course gas everywhere. Um, so the takeaway point here is that they um, evolve differently, but not independently. And we really need to understand um, how all of this works. And so going back to disks, uh, this is kind of what we imagine uh, the disk to look like. Uh, so if we start with particles somehow distributed in the disk and we let these effects um, at play, uh, then we'll see the large particles and they do sediment down to the midplane. And uh, the small particles that are very well coupled to the turbulent gas, uh, they will spread uh, vertically. If the animation is loading, hopefully. So this works in the vertical direction, um, just as well as in the radial, I was, as I was already explaining. So large particles are also drifting inward. And it also works in the azimuthal um, direction, meaning if you have some asymmetry in the disk, uh, then it actually will, um, will also azimuthal concentrate particles. Okay, so large grain sediment, small ones um, do not really sediment. And then if we let also radial drift happen, um, remember it's always towards higher pressure. So large particle sediment to the mid and move inward. And this is now a problem because if we, um, if we want to grow planetesimals, the building blocks of planets, um, then these particles are actually going away before we can do that. Um, and so for a theoretician, that is not a problem. We just invent a pressure bump somewhere Remember, particles go to higher pressure. So these particles go to higher pressure, but then they get stuck at the maximum. And only the ones inward are really lost towards inner disk. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, and the problem is solved, right? And so you might wonder what causes uh, these pressure bumps. And we'll talk about this uh, very briefly later. But now that I hope you're convinced that the particle size matters because particles um, evolve differently, uh, what you should also realize is uh, then the size evolution matter. So if a particle is always small or always large, it will behave differently from a particle that starts small and becomes large. Um, and I'm also showing this in those two simulations here. So um, these are two identical setups um, of dust evolution, and you see how the surface density evolves. In the left case, particles have always the same size. And you see that the evolu evolution is very different from the right where particles start small and then uh, grow and they move as they grow. So if we look in one of these simulations, that's what they typically look at, uh, look like. Um, we have very fast growth in the inner region, the outer regions are catching up and particles never grow larger than one of these uh, lines. So the first line here is called the fragmentation barrier. Particles grow up until the point where they fragment. And the outer part we call the drift barrier. So these are particles that drift um, as fast as they grow. So they can't really just move to larger sizes. They at the, the same time have to move inwards. And now you might notice a problem. Uh, we only grow at best uh, something like centimeter, a couple of centimeter size grains. That's not what we can uh, build planets from. Uh, no planetesimals are formed. So to make planetesimals, we need some additional magic. And that is called the streaming instability. Uh, the streaming instability is basically an instability of a dust and gas mixture under the right conditions. It forms these uh, filamentary structures, and some of these over densities can become so dense that they collapse to gravitationally bound bodies, the planetesimals. But this doesn't really work um, just by itself. It needs the right conditions, and the right conditions is you have to have already particles that we would call pebbles, and you need to create an over density. <clears throat> 
And if you want to learn more about this and how it works or what part might not work yet, uh, then I encourage you to look at the, um, at the full talk. So there's a bit of a new paradigm coming out of what I've told you so far. The problem is we can't really grow planetesimals by making them collide and become ever bigger. Um, and the small dust, we can't collapse um, because the particles are just too well coupled to the gas. But those two methods of making planetesimals, they can work together because particle growth um, creates pebbles relatively easily. And those pebbles can also be collapsed relatively easily if the dust is accumulated somehow. So the idea is that you have dust evolution creating the pebbles, and then uh, you need just some method of um, making an accumulation of dust, some pressure um, over density, um, and then you have the right conditions to make planetesimals. So the open question is, of course, still how do you make any substructure that causes such traps? For this, I would encourage you to look at Jehan Bay's talk. Um, and if you want to know what's going on, what might be going on in snow lines, uh, then I would encourage you to look at uh, Miriam and my uh, YouTube talk. So the summary uh, for, the, um, for the theory part is the following. Dust grows and transport go hand in hand. They create this kind of picture and planetesimals can form if the particles grow and are accumulated. And now after all of this theory in the last uh, few minutes, I want to turn to observations uh, to basically check if this is all working. And you have seen this and similar pictures before already. So this has been uh, John Andrews D sharp survey where we see substructure everywhere. So apparently um, something um, that collects dust must be going on. And uh, with such a relatively large sample and many rings that we see here, we can start to do statistics. Um, and in case Dulemon's paper, um, we showed that these rings are resolved and they are narrower than the gas could be. Um, so at least for these points that are between the green and the red, uh, orange line, uh, that really has to involve dust trapping. So dust trapping seems to be going on. And secondly, what we also saw and also other studies found is that all these rings seem to have more or less the same optical depth. And that's strange because that's very different disks with very different stars, very different sizes, different ages, different masses. Why should they conspire to all have the same optical depth in their rings? Um, and so we tested this. And if we just tried to fit the outer ring in one of these models, to no surprise, um, if we look at the evolution of the optical depth with time, it becomes really optically thick because the outer ring just keeps collecting the dust. And you know, um, you could fine tune it if you start with less ma mass or so on, uh, but there's no particular reason why it should end up exactly at the observed optical depth. Uh, but one thing that can help is if planetesimal formation is happening there, because um, planet uh, planetesimal formation really eats up all the extra material um, under those conditions. And so even with very different initial conditions, as long as you accumulate enough dust, you will always eat up the extra material um, and instead end around an optical depth just below 0.5 or so. So that means uh, these rings and the optical depth might be an indication that there could be planet formation uh, be either going on right now or having happened before. What else can we check? Uh, well, we can look, as Laura already nicely showed, um, for different wavelengths. So here you see the same disk, I am loop, once in scattered light, where we see the small dust uh, scattering along the surface. And uh, this really looks like a hamburger. So it's pr um, vertically extended. It's pretty large. It really looks uh, puffed up. And if we go to the millimeter, uh, you see that we have something that's much smaller. So that speaks for radial drift. Um, it's also um, consistent with pancake flat. If you try to basically fit this, you will see here we are kind of looking into a breakfast bowl. It's really a flared disk. Well, this one is consistent with being very, very flat. Okay, so this is um, evidence for both uh, vertical settling and radial drift going on. And it works also in those cases uh, where we have, um, where we think there's a planet causing it. Um, in the theoretical model, you expect the small grains to extend further inward than the large grains. And that is also uh, here uh, predicted in relative transfer models and here observed um, in disks. So again, the large grains concentrated in the rings and the small ones extending further out and further in. So that brings me to the end of this talk. Um, uh, the summary of the observational part. 
we think the parts that work is that dust particles have to grow, uh, they have to drift to explain some of these traps. Um, so that part seems to be working and pressure bumps um, are where dust particles grow and where we even think they might be forming planetesimals. But there's a lot of open questions in the field as well. For example, dust grain sizes and uh, porosity are still very different, difficult to understand. Also the growth at early stages poorly understood. And we, I think, really like a global modeling uh, for the excellent data that we have right now, where we see interesting features and scattered light and very different uh, features that sometimes don't really match up and don't really make sense for theorists um, at ALMA wavelengths. That's all from my side. Uh, thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. OK, we are, again, running a bit short. We'll eat a little bit into our break, and I'll take one question. Um, uh, I'm just actually trying to so one of the questions I thought was sort of interesting is for to get the streaming instability, you need to concentrate the dust. Is that correct? And what processes would concentrate the dust to the point that the streaming instability becomes viable? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite catch, catch that. Um, maybe, maybe you misunderstand it, but to get to streaming instability, you need to sort of concentrate the dust. You need like a higher dust to gas mass ratio. Exactly. And yeah. so, yeah, what, what kind of processes would actually uh, increase this ratio so that you could, the instability, the dust, inst uh, the streaming instability would, what could occur? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a whole slew of different ideas. Um, the most obvious one is again planets, right? Uh, but then you might have the problem, uh, you want to form planets, um, but you already need planets for that. And that's why um, a lot of other ideas have been put forward, um, where also magnetic field um, effects can cause regions of high and low magnetic pressure and therefore create over densities where the dust is trapped. Um, so um, it can, of course, be mass loss and winds. And um, as I mentioned, snow lines, especially the water snow line, are also fascinating regions uh, where things are much more complicated, but where you also um, can probably accumulate dust uh, to the extent where planet has, um, streaming instability can create planetesimals. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this if you're interested in the YouTube um, video, the full talk. Yeah. So, so again, everyone should uh, take a look at the YouTube talk. Uh, and if there are more questions, of which there are many, um, so Teal, please go to the, uh, the Q&A and uh, answer. Uh, there's a bunch of questions uh, that are quite good um, uh, about your talk. Um, so I think, uh, first, it was a really fascinating session. So thank you, all of the speakers. Uh, to now, we have a break at this point.